welcome everybody to today's SIMS executive webinar. I'm, I'm very pleased to see that we have uh, so many attendees for today's session. Um, I think you'll get some very valuable information from it um, regarding uh, the use of SIMS, uh, the business benefits it can provide, and how to make a case for SIMS uh, within your organization. Uh, I, I'm Abby Weisenthal, head of the uh, SIMS Business Board. Our presenter today will be John Footen. John is the head of Global Broadcast Consulting for Cognizant and has uh, put together a very uh, thoughtful, detailed presentation uh, regarding uh, SIMS business imperatives. We're also being assisted by uh, Jean-Pierre Evane from the European Broadcast Union. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn the presentation over to John. If you have a question for John, because we would like this to be very interactive, just type the question into the chat window and I will raise it with John. And uh, you don't have to wait until the end of the presentation to ask your question. Just one more housekeeping note uh, before I uh, uh, turn it over to John. Uh, a lot of good SIMS information is in the Advanced Media Workflow Association newsletter. If you would like to subscribe to that newsletter, just go to www.amwa.tv and just below the um, AMWA calendar, you will see a link to subscribe to the newsletter. Again, that's www.amwa.tv. And uh, take it away, John. All right, great. Thank you, Abby. Um, so as Abby said, I'm from Cognizant. We uh, work as a systems integrator and a business and technical consultancy in the media space. And what I'm here to talk about today are the business imperatives around the FIMS initiatives. So we're going to be focusing today specifically on what are the business cases for implementing PIMS within your organization and the business issues and business solutions that come out of PIMS. Um, next slide, please. So let's uh, start off by talking about the current media landscape. Uh, as you know, there's been a lot of change over the last 10 years. If it's actually probably uh, perhaps longer. And those changes are accelerating. Uh, the number of devices that need to be supported by media companies, the number of business models that need to be supported by media companies, and the number of different interactions with audiences in social media and other new media are proliferating. So whereas literally just seven or eight years ago, we had just one linear channel to think about, now we have in most media companies, dozens of channels of distribution that need to be considered for your media. So there's been a massive change, bottom line. And like I said, it's not just that the media itself and the distribution methods are changing, but also perhaps more importantly, there's a lot of experimentation in those business models. So, and I'm sure you're all seeing this in your, in your businesses especially the commercial broadcasters, where they're looking for different ways to create new revenue streams for their organization. Um, FIMS is a great method to help enable all of this change. So uh, continuing on, you need to be very flexible today. If you're a business in the media space today, you're going to have to make a lot of changes very, very quickly. All right, next slide. All right, current business demands. So on this slide here, you see the kind of things that you would be seeing if you work in the technology or operations side of the business. These are the kinds of things that the business is going to be demanding of you in order to fulfill their needs and their you know, and what they're facing in terms of change. So um, first of all, they're desperately in need of faster innovation. Um, sometimes you'll see a senior executive say, you know, we're going to want to put up a new service and it's got to be ready on X date, which, you know, to be frank, might be just a few months away. Um, and so you need to support that. 
And if you have one of those traditional models of your operations and technology where everything is tightly coupled, then you're going to have a lot of trouble achieving that kind of flexibility and rapidity in making changes. And looking at the second item, the speed at which content needs to move through your system is accelerating, um, rapidly uh, accelerating, I would, I would argue. So from the time the piece of content is produced to the window in which it needs to be on another platform like uh, iTunes, Netflix, whatever, is dramatically accelerating. People want everything at the same moment, so that's what the viewers are looking for, and so your need to turn things around very quickly is changing. You also need to be able to support rich metadata to support those new business models. Um, those new business models have a lot of interaction with customers, and they're going to need a much richer metadata set in order to be successful. And you're also going to need to be able to support that, that big data buzzword that we hear so much about and provide a much more cogent analysis of what's going on in the business. So all that data that it's moving around, the metadata about the viewers, the, 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 the metadata about the media, the data about your systems, all of that is especially useful in these new business models where the business doesn't know exactly how this new stuff is going to work, and they need to be able to analyze what's going on very rapidly. Next slide, please. Additionally, we have increased and more rigorous management of the data that you do have. The first thing that I think about there is something like rights information. If you make mistakes with that information, the potential liabilities can be very dramatic and it is getting much more complex with all of these different distribution platforms and business models. So what you really need is a much more rigorous and much more structured way of handling everything. And you need also to make sure that you make the most efficient use of those resources that you have. So since there's a lot more that you have to accomplish, you can't afford to have your technology sitting idle. And it's not just the technology that we're talking about. It's the people as well, the human resources. Um, you need an overall system that is going to make optimal use of those people and the technology at any given moment. And I'll also add that because these business models are new, the contracts between partners uh, within the media ecosystem are often very complex, and you need to adhere to these new contracts. So you're going to need to be able to handle this kind of flexibility, and you're going to need to be able to handle an increased rigor and complexity at the same time. All right, next slide. So let's dive in a little bit more on that multiple version issue for content. There's a lot of reasons for those different versions. It's not just the new devices that are, are coming online. That's perhaps the most obvious case, but if content companies are going on to the international stage, they're often going to have to deal with different regulatory environments where they're, what is allowed to be done with the content shifts from one location to another. Another example is that there are also regional and cultural differences that exist from place to place um, and that you're going to need to support, you know, whether that's through censorship or, or other changes in the content. So what, what this all means is that these cases, with all these different cases, is that there's a massive proliferation in the numbers of content that you're going to need to be able to handle and the number of partners that you're going to need to be able to distribute to. The other requirement that you have right now is an integrated digital supply chain. Right now, the supply chain of, of most media companies, I'm sure you all have seen this, is a series of islands. Um, Unfortunately, even today, it's still a series of islands that are connected by human beings that are making the steps happen in the middle. They're usually monitoring Excel spreadsheets or Word documents or, or even actually emails. Um, actually, probably the most common work order mechanism I see in the industry is the email. And that's just simply not a scalable model if you want to achieve the efficiency that we require in these businesses. 
So you really need a solid, integrated digital supply chain for your organization that handles all the video and audio formats you need, all the metadata, and all the other kinds of data necessary to make all of this stuff happen. Okay, uh, next slide. So what do we have today? And this is the problem I was discussing earlier. These problems are widespread throughout the world in terms of the way media companies are operating today. The resources that you have are typically locked into an island. So, for example, you could have this amazing transcode farm that is just in one part of your business and is totally inaccessible to any other part of your business. So you have these resources which are locked in all over the place in different uh, little islands with typically proprietary products and with proprietary interfaces to those products, which is actually why they're locked into that island. So it's, it's not easy to integrate all these systems together. You have trouble making an overall integrated digital supply chain. Because all those things are in different places, it's very difficult to monitor what's going on. You've got stuff everywhere, and it's hard to understand um, at, at one place what's going on in all the different islands. And not just the technology, but also the people, what the people are doing in that business. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, in that, in that system or that area of the business. So at the end of the day, you're not getting a lot of information about what's going on. Um, at least not uh, integrated information. And there's also typically no real link between the systems back to the business systems. And so the systems that the executives are using to manage the business are not getting direct information, at least from the technologies that are dealing with the media. Uh, there are, you know, usually there's some reports that are generated by those systems, and those reports are hand-processed to get the information to executives. What they really need, the executives uh, and those trying to manage the, the operations of the business, is real-time information from the technology systems as it affects the business. And because uh, the technology that we use today is, let's say, traditional, we are also reliant on people with traditional broadcast skill sets to achieve the, the, the overall goals of the business. And in many regions of the world, uh, we certainly see this in the United States, the number of people with broadcast, you know, traditional broadcast skill sets is in decline. And that presents a real problem for the industry. Okay, next slide. So what do we do? That's a lot of problems. What are we going to do about it? Uh, so what's the answer? Next slide, please. So let's look at the characteristics of this thing that we're going to need to, to have to fix all of these various uh, problems. So first of all, the platform we have is going to need to be very agile. It's the ability to handle change is perhaps the most important characteristic of this future platform because change is what is bringing about most of the difficulties that I mentioned before. If the business models were stable, if the media formats were stable, if the metadata was stable, we wouldn't really have this problem. So it's the agility that is probably the most important thing that we have to be able to deal with. Because you need that agility, the platform needs to be able to bring on new services rapidly without having to deal with a great deal of problems and difficulty in making whatever changes that you need to make. It also needs to have a low cost of entry to bring those new things in. It needs to be scalable. Um, it needs, you know, I'll, I'll, on the scalability, I'll say that most media companies are scaling very rapidly. Um, if nothing else, because of the increased distribution methods that they have to handle. But there's also things uh, like acquisitions of one media company by another that creates other integration and scalability problems. And of course, that uh, you know, those acquisitions of different companies typically creates even more islands that you're going to need to deal with. And so we need to be able to quickly 
you know, redeploy and quickly integrate new organizations within within our business. You know, for example, if one business model doesn't seem to be working out, the business is going to want to quickly try another one and redeploy the resources that were being used for that uh, original business model into a different business model. Uh, there's just a lot of experimentation and change going on right now, and we need systems that are able to support that. Um, another thing that's that's probably common across most organizations is that capital is in relatively short supply, and we need to have more of the expense show up in the operational domain uh, rather than the capital domain. Uh, before I move on, have we had any uh, questions yet, Abby? Um, I haven't seen any yet. Um, if anybody would like to ask a question now uh, through their audio conference, that would be fine. Or again, you could send um, a chat to me through the chat window. But so far, I don't see anything yet. OK. All right. Well, uh, if anybody has any questions, I'd love to take questions along the way. Um, OK. Next slide. So. What do we think is the best solution for all of these problems? I would say it's, you know, obviously <laughs> based on this webinar um, and also what I, I really think, it's the framework for interoperable media services, FIMS. Uh, FIMS uses a concept called service oriented architecture uh, or SOA. What SOA is in summary is that you take a function in the business. And this is not a whole presentation on SOA. There's plenty of those out there as well. Uh, but you basically take a function in the business, whatever that function may be, and you encapsulate that into a service. And what you're doing is you're encapsulating primarily technology, but it can also include people. It, it becomes a service so that you can accomplish some particular business goal. So a great example of a service that's not in our industry, but I think helps people to understand the definition of a service, is getting your, your clothes dry cleaned. So you go to the dry cleaner, you turn over your clothes, you hand them a, a ticket or order or whatever, and then you come back and they return your clothes to you clean. So that's a service that's being provided. The, the uh, input is the order that you give, the ticket and the clothes. The work order in, in, in a media service, that would be the work order in the media. And the output is returned clothing to you um, along with a receipt uh, that is the clothing has been processed. And the same thing would apply to media services. So ingest can be a service. Uh, transcoding can be a service. Editing can be a service. Playout can be a service. There are just many different services that exist within a media organization. Media and non-media services, by the way. I mean, there's there's all kinds of, you know, services that wouldn't be media per se, like scheduling, uh, traffic, you know, that kind of stuff. So everything, you know, every business function can be seen of as a service. Um, so so service-oriented architecture is a way of approaching the design of these systems so they can take advantage of the services approach. FIM specifically is a joint initiative that was started uh, many years ago. Um, I can't remember exactly how many, but quite a few, uh, between the European Broadcasting Union and the Advanced Media Workflow Association. Um, it's an attempt to create a framework that allows service-oriented architecture to be applied effectively into the media industry. Okay, next slide. So let's talk about the concept. We want to take all of the activity that is going on and have some sort of centralization. This is typically called a bus. So we want all the information that's being passed through, one, have it all passed through one sort of control and information gathering mechanism. And, and actually, sometimes people call that an enterprise service bus or ESB. It's all in one place where you can get at it. And so this solves a whole bunch of problems that I had mentioned before, you know, having it all come across one bus. You have one place to access the data no matter where those systems are. It also gives you that mechanism to interconnect all these various islands. 
And what could reduce the reliance on proprietary solutions? Uh, most of the vendors in the media space have been using proprietary interfaces in their products, and this has been a big challenge for the industry. Uh, most of them don't have as part of their core model to build those proprietary interfaces. It's just that the lack of standards has resulted in everyone needing to roll their own interfaces. So we've ended up with a plethora of them to handle. What we, what we really need is the workflow driving the technology instead of the other way around. I think, you know, in all of the experience that all of you have, you've seen that over and over where the, the details of the technology and the way the integration is done drives how the workflow will, will work rather than defining the best workflow and having the technology support that. HIMSS is a, is a way of helping to, to make that better. We also need to uh, make sure that whatever we're going to create has the same languages. And, and that's also one of the big things that HIMSS does. We have a, a common framework for how things should communicate. And we also get down into the specific services and say, this is how you communicate with a specific service. So like in the example I gave you it, with the dry cleaning, we say specifically how to place the order. Um, and we tell you what you're going to get back or what you can expect back when you make those service calls. All right, next slide. How FIMS adoption can help you. So if you adopt SIMS within your organization, what can you expect as the benefits? I think, first of all, you're going to be able to see everything a lot more clearly. Since we have the common bus that all of the information is going through, you're going to be able to make decisions about the operation of your media company to prioritize what is actually mission critical. Um, you're going to have that full picture of what's going on and the overall view, so you're going to have that visibility that you need to make decisions holistically instead of, you know, everybody in their own individual island only seeing their point of view with regards to what is important and what activities are going on. Um, it's also going to allow you some additional flexibility in system architecture and design, and this is really important. What I see in my company's case and many other companies who have worked with the FIMS uh, standard, it is much more rapid integration when, you, when you're when you using that as your starting point um, and when you're building systems. And also, uh, because of the flexibility of this architecture, you're able to pull things together more quickly, you know, the integration. And this, of course, saves you money and allows the business to get access to those new capabilities that they want more quickly. That's important. It's not just that we're saving money on the technical level um, over time, but also that you are getting uh, some additional business benefits more quickly. Let's see, also because of the parallelization, uh, I mean the overall view that you have of, of, these, of what's going on in the system, you're able to parallelize the tasks that you might not have been able to before. You're able to see how many of these things you have going on and how many you're able to get going at once. Um, and of course, you know, this allows for additional scale, the other problem I was talking about earlier. How you're going to be able to handle so many new things, you know, it is is because when you when you have this increased visibility, you're able to make intelligent decisions more easily than you would have and more quickly and make the optimal use of the resources. Um, as part of that, you know, note that the services can be used when called upon and released when they're not in use. They're, they're ultimately shared services. So uh, this is kind of like the cloud paradigm. If you're using services that come from a shared service pool, when you need your transcoder, you call on a transcoder. And when you're done, you can release it and allow those resources to be used by some other part of the organization, thus maximizing the value of that technology and the use of those resources. Okay, next slide. 
So what are some of the business benefits? A media supply chain that is more responsive to consumer needs and competitors' activities. So again, that uh, agility. That is, I, I have to say it again, the most important thing that every media company needs is the ability to react more quickly and effectively. And, and I'll point out, as it says on the slide, that it's not just the consumer or viewer's needs, um, but also reacting appropriately to what the competitors are doing. Uh, because your competitors are coming out with new business models, uh, and if they hit on one that's successful, um, you're going to need to react to that um, pretty quickly in order to you know, maintain the critical mass of audience that uh, everyone is always trying to maintain. Uh, additionally, highly efficient uh, production becomes more achievable. So as we were saying, your resources are being used more effectively, and therefore the amount of money that you put into your business can now decrease relative to the amount of output that you're producing. It might not decrease in, in absolute terms because uh, of all the increase that we're seeing in the amount of output, but uh, the amount of cost per output is, is likely to be able to decrease. Um, also, another main a good business benefit that isn't often talked about is the ability to support uh, better business continuity. It's a really important feature. Services, because of this common standardized interface, can be more easily geographically dispersed. Um, you have all kinds of options to increase your ability uh, for the business to be maintained. And, it, and if things change, whether that's for an emergency or just, as I was saying before, changing for the business model, you're going to have more a more flexible system that can make those changes more easily, more quickly. All right, next slide. Let's look at the financial benefits. So one of the key ones, is, is that you're going to be able to pilot new services for your viewers or customers. Uh, you have the ability to try new things much more easily than under the traditional model where these kinds of new things were often difficult to get off the ground. Another uh, financial benefit is reduced cost in terms of integration. As I mentioned before, it is faster and the speed means that you need less resources to achieve uh, the integration that you need, and that helps your bottom line. And as I mentioned before, it's possible to find more ways to make your expenditures uh, operational rather than capital. Um, that's because in some cases, services can be a shared service where you're just paying the operational cost of using that service rather than building your own with a whole lot of capital. Also, this thing, allow, you know, going down this path allows you to use a lot more off-the-shelf components. Um, one of the things I didn't mention earlier is that FIMS is based on IT concepts that have been around a very long time uh, in the general IT industry and are also applicable in our industry. So also uh, we, we have various technologies that are used in much in the much larger IT industry that are now available to us as well. We get to basically leverage the big IT guys in the big IT industry. All right, next slide. So operational benefits. Um, if you're on the operational side, you're going to be able to get changes done more quickly. That's you know a core part of your mission. Um, so when an executive says, I need this done, you have the tools, architecture, et cetera, to get it done more quickly. A migration path is also possible from existing workflows. Most of these tool sets that we find in the service-oriented architecture space have the ability to have both an existing workflow running in parallel with a new workflow, and over time you can make a change from the existing workflow to the new. As I, I mentioned before, improved use of uh, the resources um, uh, especially, you know, in the case of operations, your human resources, um, they're better focused on what they actually need to be working on. You have a better view. Um, and, you know, like I mentioned, you have all these islands. You have people who are spending time managing spreadsheets, emails, and there's a whole lot of other human activity that we could automate if we just had a better integrated system. Um, and, and, and the people who are doing this thing, these things are quite valuable. I mean, they're highly, potentially very talented. Um, and, um, 
and they're spending a lot of time on, on activities which are really not that valuable um, just to keep the process moving. So I, like I said, I think that it's important to consider that uh, we can automate some of these rote tasks that uh, are required because everything's in islands when we can bring it all together. Uh, and perhaps uh, most importantly to the future health of our industry, we're going to be able to capitalize on uh, the future pool of IT resources versus, you know, your traditional broadcast engineers. And I think that's uh, important for the long haul. Okay, next slide. Uh, before Technology. we go on to the next slide, John, does anyone have any questions up till now? You guys have been pretty silent. So again, if you, if you have a question, please uh, uh, type it in the chat window or use the raising your hand um, icon at the bottom of the participant screen. Thanks. Yeah, it, it's, it must be that I'm completely clear. <laughs> and uh, anyway, all right, so next slide then. I think there were questions. I think somebody asked whether companies have been reaching those benefits already. Oh, okay. Um, maybe you're seeing uh, questions and we're not. So if you yeah, please, I'm, I'm not seeing it either. So thanks, Jean Pierre. Yeah, it looks like they're just sending probably questions to the host. Um, okay, so what was the question again, Jean Pierre? I'm sorry. Somebody asked whether some companies have reported really um, well seeing these benefits. Oh, yes. Uh, that's a great question. Um, I'm actually going to cover that a little bit in a later slide, but um, I'll talk about it now. Yes, there are, FIMS has been around for a few years now, um, and so it has been implemented in numerous companies. Uh, I'll be talking a little bit about more of that, about that later. Um, but yes, uh, very specifically, benefits have been seen from those companies that have implemented FIMS. There are some case studies uh, available on the FIMS website, uh, but I can tell you that the decreased time for integration and the increased automation uh, can really create clear and measurable benefits uh, from day, day one of implementation. Any other questions, Jean-Pierre? Well, what I have seen is that some people say the chat is not working, although I can see all the messages on my screen, and probably you should see that too because I'm sharing my desktop, uh, which is surprising. Uh, uh, that's, a, that's a fact. So um, if you still have questions using the chat, please do it because I can see them, and maybe you can see it in yellow that appears on my screen at the top of my screen. Yeah, I'm I'm looking at your screen, and I can't see yeah. any of the questions that are being yeah. submitted. So, um, Another question is about the availability of the presentations, and I will tell you more about this at the end of the presentation. Okay. All right, yeah, so Jean-Pierre, just jump in anytime if you see questions coming in to yeah. you. Yeah. Can, can All you right, let's switch to the I can see there was another one here. The problem is that I'm not... About technology, is the young... Is the only option is low cost? This I do not understand exactly what is meant. So here, yeah, can you see on my screen the different questions? No, we can't see your questions. No, we, so you'll just we have can't to read see them. It. Okay. Um, can we consider options that will be more expensive, but with short return on investment? So is there something that is not necessarily going to save costs, but that is going to be uh, faster in implementation? That's, an, uh, that's one of the questions. Okay, let me let me repeat it back and see if I'm understanding. What, what it's, what's being asked here is if there are situations where implementing FIMS would be more expensive and whether we can consider other options um, in those those scenarios. This is, not similar? In, this, yeah, this is not exactly how I read the question. So the it, it seems that the interpretation is that FIMS is presented as one of the technologies that allows to save costs, okay? But there could be other solutions which are more expensive than FIMS but allow us to have faster return on investment. Yeah, I, I, I guess that's theoretically possible. I'm not aware of what those solutions would be. FIMS is, you know, you could, you could implement something 
creating your own interface model. Now, maybe what you're maybe what the person suggesting is that this is a, a situation where the integration already exists between two systems, um, in which case it would be cheaper and faster to potentially put that in. Um, and that's a that's a that's a judgment call that has to be made um, in any given project uh, regarding you know what which approach makes sense. Um, but I would say that if you're creating an interface, there's no reason not to go with the FIMS approach uh, versus just making up your own. Effectively, FIMS provides you that starting point, um, even if you're creating interfaces that are not already covered in the FIMS services, using the FIMS uh, framework and some of the FIMS metadata models and things like that is going to uh, be a benefit to you um, versus completely doing it on your on your own. So, okay. um, go ahead. Yes, I, I think I have identified the problem with the chat. So, I, I think people should not send the questions only to the host, but they should send their questions to everybody so that every everyone can see the questions. That would make things easier. Yes. Um, one of the other questions is, um, what are the flagship implementations today? So we can speak right. of, of Bloomberg, we can speak of different companies who are using it today already. Yeah, so I, 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 exactly. So I've got a, a slide coming up later with a bunch of, of, na of names of media companies, and that's really not even a complete list. Um, but yeah, there's a bunch of, of, of uh, ones out there. The Bloomberg implementation was probably the, the first uh, complete uh, implementation that was done. It won the IBC award um, a couple years ago, and it uh, has also been in operation the longest and has seen the greatest benefits from that implementation. Um, um, other organizations I've worked with, I'm not allowed to talk about their names because of the nature of being a consultancy, um, but I know of other, multiple other organizations where it's been implemented. We've seen pilots done in organizations like the CBC. We've seen uh, Turner is also doing some stuff. Abby, you might want to mention briefly, you know, Turner's been involved in looking at FIMS. Yeah. Uh, yes, Turner. Turner is um, investigating an implementation uh, first of the FIMS repository service, and um, then shortly after we'll, we'll begin to take a look at some of the um, other services uh, available in FIMS 1.1. 1, 1 .1. And this takes us back to a question from Darren. He was saying, do you have tangible metrics? So I remember that, for instance, last year, um, Roman Makiewicz from Bloomberg, he came with a, a number of figures saying how much he gained in productivity. So probably I, ca I can make you um, contact um, Roman, Darin, if you wish. Yeah, if you go to the FIMS website, you'll find on there an implementers list, and uh, that list both, uh, for those who've been willing to talk about it publicly, um, those that list those users or, or broadcast or media organizations that have implemented FIMS, as well as the technology companies that have implemented FIMS interfaces. And on there, you'll see specifically the Bloomberg's uh, 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 case study or the Bloomberg uh, organization on that list. And Roman from, from there is happy to uh, talk about um, the benefits that they've seen, including some specific metrics. Um, they're pretty dramatic. Um, I can't. I don't. I don't want to say, say them without looking them up to make sure I don't misquote. But we're talking multiples of of improvements in uh, either speed or uh, efficiency, and definitely savings in cost. Um, so I recommend that you take a look at that on the website, as well as uh, you know, reach out to other media companies. In fact, that's one of my big re uh, recommendations towards the end of this uh, presentation. So there was another yeah. question about prioritization, and uh, I, 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 the, the question was more specifically that if you have, a, if you are ingesting some content, that maybe it's that you need to stop ingesting because you have to play out. So this is more meaningful. Yeah. So I guess, yeah. I guess you would like to say how this is handled by FIMS. Yeah. So FIMS has within it a whole 
um, life cycle of job management. So that's all specified within the framework. And that, uh, you know, assuming that the underlying services are built to support it, uh, the, FIMS, uh, the FIMS framework defines the, the states and the, and the inputs and outputs required to cause a job to be paused, canceled, um, to have a job priority change. Um, so all of that has been considered by FIMS. All of us that have worked on this over the years uh, come from media, so we're very aware of how much things can change from time to time, and so that was all accounted for um, from the very first version of FIMS. So now before we move forward, um, John, there is one last question, which is, um, is there an SDK available? So we have some example implementation. Yes. There's a, there is uh, what I guess you could call an SDK. It's available, again, via the FIMS website. There includes on it um, both the documentation, documentation of the general framework, as well as an interactive documentation of each of the services that's available. And there are WSDLs, um, XSDs, and there are uh, sample implementations that show how to implement the various services within within a FIMS context. So yes, there's quite a bit of information available in FIMS 1.1 that's on the website. All right, so we can move forward. Great. All right, so if you're going to be taking a file-based approach or creating a file-based workflow today, obviously technology uh, benefits are going to come from using uh, a FIMS approach. I, I think, and this sort of relates to one of the questions that was already asked, but I think that there's really no other approach for architecture to take in a file-based workflow. Um, I'm going to talk about some, in a little bit later, I'm going to talk about some of the ways that you go about approaching the start of an implementation, but I would suggest that if you're going to be building a new system, that you're going to go down a services-oriented approach. All other approaches will lead over time to greater complexity, and FIMS and SOA in general is something that values simplicity over complexity, and therefore efficiency. Um, this approach also reduces the reliance on proprietary solutions, and that's always a value. Um, best of breed products are easier to incorporate. You're able to identify which is the best of breed for a given specific problem and swap that out as needed because each of the products would have a common interface. I think probably a good example on that is transcoding or QA where one product might be better uh, than another um, at at doing a particular function and you're able to swap around as needed um, to get the best of breed in every case. I've also uh, already mentioned the flexibility and scalability. Uh, the installation and modification of new services is easier. Um, I just say in general, there's a reduced intensity and tempo in the IT and technical staff around the maintenance of, a, of an overall system. It gives you the ability uh, a little more easily to, to move things into the cloud, um, which provides, you know, on its own, it's a different topic really, but it provides numerous benefits. Among them is the ability to spin up test environments more easily than we do today, and that's really a critical, critical thing. Okay, next slide. So since uh, we have obviously are selling you on uh, what a great thing this is and, and what a great value, let me talk about how you get there. So first of all, and this is really critical, you do not need to go all the way and do a massive FIMS project. I would in fact argue that FIMS is not something that you really do per se, but it's rather an approach that you use in your next project. So over time, you're going to migrate existing systems into this new architecture. You don't need everything to be FIMS compliant at the same time um, in order for this to work. You just look at where wherever the pain points are in your workflows and focus on those first. Make, you know, 
make a small um, step forward and you will start to see the benefits, especially if you're, if you're doing it in those pain, at those areas and those pain points where there is, um, it's a relatively easy solution and making, you know, increasing some automation, et cetera, is going to increase your, your user acceptance. Um, and, and like I said, uh, we, this question came up before about the real world. There are now multiple real world, um, real world implementations out there. And I recommend that you draw on the experience of other media organizations who have volunteered to put their information on the, the implementer list um, or consultants um, or, or whomever. But, you know, there, there's a lot that's already been done out there. So there's an opportunity to learn from what's already, what's already been done. So just start with some particular pain point uh, that's, that's easier to implement, and you'll start to see value right away. All right, next question. Yeah. PIMS in action. So this is what I was talking about. These are some, and this is definitely not all, of the media organizations that have implemented PIMS. Um, in fact, there's a lot more. Um, uh, they're also, and this isn't on this list or on the slides, but there's also a lot of vendors who have implemented products with a FIMS interface. So take a look at the FIMS website. You're going to be able to find a complete list of organizations and contacts and things like that in order to, to ask questions um, about what their experience or what their implementations are. All right, next slide. And, and just to remind everybody, that's www.fims.tv. Yep, if you go to the next slide, you'll see that yeah. on there. Before we go on to the next slide, there was a question. I think it was already there, but it has been repeated by Ron Clifton from PBS. He's asking, what's the difference between a framework and a standard? Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually probably am using the word standard uh, inappropriately. The framework part of this um, is, it is an overall set of guidance about how to approach building something. Um, so it's it, it's a pretty holistic view of how you put together a, an SOA-based system in the media space. I, I can't say that our framework is fully fleshed out. In fact, I am certain and, and confident that it is not. There are still elements, for example, resource management, where the framework needs to, uh, to be extended further. Um, but... It does provide a great deal of, of things like, for example, how you, how you deal with the life cycle of a service, how you deal with job management, um, some of the basic principles, uh, the metadata model. So a lot of elements of what you need are there. It's a, it's a kit. It's a complete kit um, of things that you need to get things built. Yeah, and Anything there is else? another question. Yeah, there is another question, which is um, when you implement, what are the pitfalls? What should, what should you be looking at more particularly when you implement it? Yeah, okay, that's a good question. Um, I think probably the biggest um, deficiency currently in the FIMS project is the relatively low number of services that we've created to date. I think we have four complete ones and a fifth one that is in draft. Um, the ones that we have done are capture, transfer, transcode, or um, transform, I think is what we called it, and repository, and the QA service is, is approaching completion, um, QAQC. So those are critical services, and actually, if you look at any media workflow, those represent a huge portion of the overall steps that happen in the media industry. However, there are big areas of services where there isn't uh, anything. And all of the real world implementations that I've had to do, um, we do have to create additional services for which there is no current FIMS, stand, uh, FIMS standard for that service. However, we still use FIMS even in those new services because we use the framework and we use the principles that are seen in the other services in building our new ones. 
and um, I think it's been pretty successful so far. The other, the other big pitfall that you can face is the potential that uh, the, when you do your first project, the very first one that you do, you're going to find it's more expensive and more time consuming than you, than you probably expected. Um, so you, you do need to get through that first project where you get everything spun up and you deal with a lot of those first time issues and then you'll really start to see the benefits. Um, I'm going to move on just in terms of time, and then we'll see if there's some time for some more questions at the end. Yeah, um, there, there are some more questions coming. Okay. Um, so I'll just be real quick on the rest of the slides just to focus on the questions. Uh, so FIMS is groundbreaking. It's uh, achievable, uh, but, you know, like I said, there's been lots of real-world implementations, so I think you can, um, you can definitely feel confident in going down the FIMS path. FIMS uh, promises agility and efficiency, which is something that I've repeated over and over. Um, and the activities in FIMS track the real world business needs. But um, I do need to say that we need more input. I see a lot of different media companies here on the call today. Um, it'd be wonderful to get all of you to join into the business board or the technical board um, and get your input um, as to what we're going to do next. We could do a lot of things. Um, but uh, it would be really great to get your input into whatever it is that we do next. Um, and like I said before, you can learn more about everything um, related to FIMS on www.fims.tv. And, and this so, is Abby. If, if you'd like to join the business board, just send me an email. You can see the spelling of my name up there on the chat screen. It's just abby.wise.com at turner.com yep and incidentally okay. our meetings are usually the first Wednesday of each month but due to IBC our next meeting I believe is uh, later on in September uh, yes it is it's going to be September 24th um, is our next business board meeting yeah and that's the, the group that helps define, based on the real-world needs of, of media companies, what uh, what we work on. So I recommend uh, recommend joining from from media companies. The vendors should join the technical board. John, are you ready for a couple of uh, additional questions? Yeah, um, and so, you cut me cut cut off whenever you want, and then talk about IBC and. Uh, okay. So the. There was some clarification about the question on cost. So now the question as it reads is, it has been mentioned a few times that the only alternative is to buy low cost IT technology. Can we consider purchasing more expensive stuff that can bring better efficiency and good work? Ah, yes, of course. Um, yes, you can spend more money um, and get benefits from spending more money. It's not absolutely required that you buy low cost. You can either buy more expensive IT equipment, which will have in and of, of itself perhaps you know greater efficiencies for that greater cost. But also, there you know the proprietary stuff that's out there can be implemented within our systems by wrapping it. So you take the existing interface into that product and you wrap it with a FIMS wrapper that exposes that product instead of with its proprietary interface with a, a FIMS interface. And so you can still use perhaps that very high-speed, best-of-breed proprietary solution, but provide it with a common interface. And uh, there is another question, which is, um, well, things are changing so fast that how can we keep the pace when developing a standard to, fu to fulfill new requirements and needs? Yeah, that's a great question and one that the FIMS Administrative Board uh, especially tries to, to think about. There is, there are things changing more, most very quickly. One of the approaches and strategies we've taken from the beginning of the project was to do those kind of common services that are very basic. We haven't gotten into more esoteric services um, because of all the change. But it's an absolutely good point that the speed of standardization is critical. And the way that we're going to increase our speed, the, the, the real driver of the speed in any standards uh, effort is human beings. So if you can join the organization and provide your input, value, and 
and work into it, then we're going to be able to move even faster. Um, now there is another another comment which has been made. I'm just finishing my chat. So from uh, Chan Tok K, he says, um, oh, most of the companies who are implementing films are from the EBU. So that's not quite true. <laughs> Several companies are also from the US. So there are European yeah. broadcasters, but, and there are also American broadcasters who are also associated to the EBU, but not necessarily EBU. And he says, what about ABU? The Asian yes. Yep. Yeah, that's a great, uh, great point. Uh, first of all, in, in the Americas, there are a number of implementations. Um, there's, you know, at least uh, six or more that I can think of immediately in my brain. Um, so there's a, there are a number of implementations already underway in the United States and uh, North America. Uh, in Asia, there's absolutely no reason that this should not be done. There's nothing different about the Asian technology or Asian workflows that would cause this not to be appropriate. And like I said, we picked the most basic of, of services to implement first. So I highly recommend that Asian broadcasting organizations do take a look at this. Um, and we absolutely welcome the participation of Asian broadcasters in our group. Um, and would would love to have them, them be a part. And and by the way, I will be attending the ABU Technical Committee in Macau in uh, October. So I will make a presentation about film there by that time. Oh, excellent! So that will help spread the word in Asia. Yeah. Another question is from uh, Chris from Guillaume Lemoine. So he says, "Hey, what do you need to do on your data model?" So ask on a, your what? On your data model. So I, I would say ask a and &E, they are spending a lot of time working on, the data, on their data model right now from films. Yes. Yeah, there's a lot of activity around the data model. We, we make uh, tweaks and improvements, and we welcome your participation in, in the group as well. Um, Anything else, Jean-Pierre, or should we talk about IBC a little bit? The very last question is a little bit more technical. That's about the relationship of films we are with RS422 or VDCP or most. Yeah, so, um, okay. Uh, first of all, just a quick note. For more technical information, there's a YouTube channel um, that has a lot of more technical presentations on it. I recommend, and this, this presentation may be on there as well. I recommend taking a look at the YouTube channel for some more technical presentations. Uh, quickly, uh, FIMS versus 422, MOS, uh, VDCP. This is, you know, first of all, this is not a real-time protocol. So um, when you mention VDCP um, or 422, I think a real-time, uh, there is an effort underway by Synthi that's uh, uh, trying to deal with real-time. That's called MDC. Um, it's in the Synthi 34CS group. Um, so you can see some published standards on real-time protocols that are, you know, modern protocols. SPIMS is a is a non-real-time protocol, and, and but it can be used in real time. It's it's really around the workflow. This isn't about controlling a server. This is about controlling the overall workflow of an organization. So it's stepping up a level from from perhaps what you're thinking of there. Um, so I would say that you know you. you, you you want to take a look at the, the kinds of technologies you're talking about. You might want to take a look at Symphy's uh, MDC uh, effort, which is around real-time, and consider FIMS for the non-real-time workflow uh, efforts that you do. Okay. So now um, what I can say, I can say a few things about what's going to happen at IBC. Okay. Uh, at IBC, we have, I, I sent a lot of things on the chat, so probably people have seen this. I have sent a lot of information. So I really. If you switch to the next slide, you'll see uh, uh, the. Also more. Okay. okay, right. Oh, yes, true. So, what's going to happen? So, um, more info on the films user, yes, LinkedIn group as well. And um, so let me summarize what is the situation. So first of all, the presentation. The presentation will be made available, I guess we'll post it on the films.tv website, but it's also going to be made available through the tech.edu.ch website. You follow the event link and you will have access to the, the presentation. 
uh, if the quality is good enough, we are going to uh, put this on the YouTube channel um, uh, with a presentation from John and the slides. Uh, then we have a meeting on Sunday 14th at IBC at the Holiday Inn near the Rye Conference Center. So it starts at 11.30 and you are welcome to join. This is an open meeting where everybody can come and it is preceded by a themes dev meeting which is only for those who have signed the participation agreement, which we request to be signed because we want to protect the royalty-free environment in which the project is working. Except this, um, there is going to be a lot of presentations made at the, um, at the EBU village on things, and we are going to make this uh, schedule available on the um, LinkedIn user group for things. And this information will be, will be made available there. We might also use that list, actually, to send a lot of that information, the list of those who said they will attend this uh, webinar. Otherwise, Abby told you where you contact her. I also sent you my email details, eva at ebu.ch. So if you need any further information on how to join teams, for instance, you can contact us. Now, John, I let you close the webinar. Okay. All right, well, thank you very much. I know we've run a little bit over. Um, some great questions out there. If there are any additional questions, you're welcome to email me. My email is john.footen at cognizant.com. Thank you very much for joining, and uh, I hope to see some of you at IBC. And this is Abby, and thank you, and I hope to welcome a lot of you to the FIMS Business Board. Thank you, John. Thank you, Abby. Thank you all for joining the call. And see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.